All right, I got a presentation here on OPNAV 5119, Chapter B6, Respiratory Protection. To get it started, let's talk about the two classifications of respirators. We're going to talk about air purifying respirators and atmosphere supplying respirators. Those are our two main classes of respirators, air purifying and atmosphere supplying. Atmosphere supplying, just like the name says, provides some sort of atmosphere. It produces the breathable air that the patient or that the, uh, the person using the respirator is going to use. It's going to make air independent of the environment. Whereas our air purifying respirator, that guy is going to remove air contaminants by filtering or absorbing them as they pass through a cartridge. So it's using the air that's already in the atmosphere, but it's filtering it. The air is coming in from the atmosphere and being filtered through some sort of cartridge system. System, right and in order to use this because we're using it in the atmosphere that's already present oxygen needs to be present in that atmosphere because it's not producing any kind of air there's no oxygen apparatus or anything like that uh, attached to it so it's it's got a, you, you can only use them if there's enough oxygen and we're going to define sufficient oxygen as 19.5 percent so in order to use an air purifying respirator since it doesn't produce any air uh, we have to have at least 19.5 percent of oxygen in the air so our air purifying filters, uh, respirators, they, they break into two categories. We talk about powered air purifying respirators and then our non-powered air purifying respirators. And we'll talk uh, in detail about each one of these. Our non-powered air purifying respirators are going to be divided into nine classifications. And it's NIOSH who establishes, certifies these respirators and sets up these uh, classifications. The National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Okay, so nine classifications. And the way we get there is we've got three filter classes and then three levels of efficiency for each one of those filter classes. And those filter classes, we're going to say they're NRP. And each one of these has, has to do with what kind of atmosphere we can use this, fil this uh, filter class class in. So uh, if we're working with an N mask, an N mask, an N filter class cannot be used if oil aerosols are present in the atmosphere. So we're going to say they are not resistant to oil. Whereas our R class, our R class can be used in the presence of an oil aerosol, but only for a single shift. So we can say that they're oil resistant. Whereas our P class, these can be used in the presence of oil aerosols multiple times. So we're going to say that they are oil proof. Um, not only are these classifications pertain to the, the atmosphere we can, uh, we can work them in, they're also color coded. And the, other, the only color coding this chapter really covers is the P class. We're going to, and the P class are always going to be magenta slash purple. So you can see right here on the side, we've got a P class non-powered air purifying respirator because these cartridges right here are purple. So after our filter class, we then got to talk about the three levels of efficiency. So each one of these filter classes in RP, they have three levels of filter efficiency. So the top level of efficiency will be 99.7%. After that, we drop down to 99, and then we drop down to 95%. So all three of these classes in RP will have a respirator in these three different efficiencies. And in You've probably seen how this works, so you didn't realize it. So, like, let's talk about N mask. So, if you have an N mask that's a 99.7% efficient mask, it would be an N100, right? If you had the 99%, we'd have an N99, and then if it's only 95, well, you might be familiar with this mask, the N95 mask. This is a mask we use whenever a patient's got is placed on airborne precautions or we're worried they have something that's highly communicable like uh, tuberculosis or disease like that. So your N95 mask. And again, our N class, they're not meant to be used in the presence of oil aerosols. Our R class, they can be, we say they're oil resistant, but can only be for a single shift. And then our P class, oil proof, they can be used in the presence of oil aerosols. So, so far, respirators, they divide into air purifying and atmosphere supplying. Air purifying uses the oxygen that's in the air, right? It filters it somehow. And our atmosphere supplying, um, we haven't really got into those, uh, but they produce the atmosphere. They produce the oxygen and usually, you know, in the form of mixed gases, but they produce it. Um, and our air purifying is going to divide into powered air purifying respirators and then our non-powered. And we've got nine classifications. All those classifications are NIOSH certified. The way we get to those nine classifications is through three filter classes and three levels of efficiency. 
So let's talk about pa uh, powered air purifying respirators for a bit here. Um, so our powered ones, um, they have to be equipped with a filter that meets the criteria for HEPA filters. And when they do, they too will be magenta or purple. And all the powered air purifying respirator is, is something that's got a power source that's pushing air through the filter. It's got some sort of battery operated fan or something like that. Now it's not, it's not producing an atmosphere. It's still pulling the air from the atmosphere. It's just got a motorized and electronic way of, of pulling it through. It's, it's powered through, but it still needs to be, it's still, you know, an air purifying respirator. So it still needs to be used in environments where there's sufficient oxygen, where there's at least 19.5% 19 oxygen in the air. All right, so a little review of what we covered so far. Uh, what are the two respirator types? Broadly, what are our two respiratory types? We've got our respirator types. We've got the air purifying and the atmosphere supplying. Air purifying and atmosphere supplying. Um, how are air purifying respirators further divided? So what are our two different types of air purifying respirators? All right, so our two types, we've got powered air purifying respirators and non-powered air purifying respirators. Powered and non-powered. All right, who certifies respirators? Who's gonna certify all the respirators? That's gonna be NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. All right, how many classifications of particulate air purifying respirators are there? How many classifications are there? There's nine. What are the three filter classes of non-powered air purifying respirators? What are our three filter classes? Our three filter classes, NRP, NRP. What filter class can be used in the presence of oil aerosols? What filter class can be used in the presence of oil aerosols? That's going to be our P class. What filter class can only be used in the presence of oil aerosols for a single shift? A single shift is going to be your R class. What color are P class air purifying respirator filters? What color are the P class air purifying respirator filters? They're going to be magenta or purple. What defines sufficient oxygen in the atmosphere? How much oxygen do we need in the atmosphere in order to use? Uh, an air purifying filter. We need at least 19.5%, 19.5%. Okay, so now let's talk about some atmosphere supplying uh, respirators. Um, and first, first things first, we'll talk about when we actually need to use these things. So atmosphere supplying respirators, these guys need to be used anytime the contaminant has no warning properties. There's not going to be any kind of clue that the contaminant is present. And there's a couple things mentioned in this chapter that have no warning properties, like uh, carbon monoxide or hydrogen cyanide or I the isocyanates or methyl alcohol. So if there's a, there's a potential for those to be in the environment, the atmosphere we're working in, you got to use an atmosphere supplying because carbon monoxide poisoning a lot of times people don't realize it's happening there's no warning there's no odor to it or anything to let you know that you you know and usually until the patient's very symptomatic that they're being exposed to carbon monoxide so if the contaminant has no warning properties we have to use something that supplies atmosphere that's making a breathable atmosphere for us to breathe um, when the contaminant's concentration is too high for air purifying there's so much of it in the air that it's just going to block up those filters so we can't even use it because it's the concentration is too high and then in environments that we say are IDLH immediately dangerous to life and health um, if, if whatever is produced in that in uh, that atmosphere is super toxic we're not going to risk it with an air purifying uh, respirator we're going to go ahead and uh, make our personnel wear atmosphere supplying atmosphere supplying respirators are going to be further divided into supplied air and self-contained breathing apparatuses and we'll talk about each one of these individually in a second here Supplied air, we got two types of supplied air respirators we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about hose mask and airline. And we're really not gonna talk about hose masks that much because it's no longer used in the fleet. And the chapter pretty much says that, that it's no longer used in the fleet and really doesn't get too much into that. Whereas an airline respirator, this one consists of a face piece, hood, helmet, or suit, a breathing tube, regulator, and a small diameter hose, and a compressor uh, ambient air breathing apparatus that provides air. So with an airline, it's just like it sounds. You, you have a line. The person has a line coming off of their mask that's attached to something that's generating atmosphere, something that's making breathable air. And with the, with the uh, supplied air, 
the uh, the apparatus that's producing their air is not being carried by the person. They have a hose that's attached to you know their mask, and this will actually be placed in the atmosphere that's not hazardous, so the atmosphere that the the person's not working in. So with that that hose length can only be a maximum of 300 feet, okay? 300 max length on this hose. So you see the coiled hose right under here? It can only be 300 feet unless otherwise specified by NIOSH, by the National Institute of Occupational uh, Safety and Health. Three types that uh, the chapter covers. Briefly, it talks about demand, uh, and it says demand are not used. It talks about pressure demand, and it talks of, and uh, the pressure demand, we'll talk about the APF in a second, and continuous flow. So your pressure demand and your continuous flow, they provide a little bit of positive pressure, meaning that they, they blow air into the mask, whereas the demand, it doesn't. You have to breathe in. You, ha it's, you have to generate a negative pressure. You have to inhale in. Well, because you do that, there's a risk of, uh, you know, losing the seal on the mass. So we don't like to use the demand ones. Uh, your pressure demand and your continuous flow, they are actually uh, pr pushing air. There's a positive pressure. And your pressure demand has a higher assigned protective factor. It's more efficient than the continuous flow. Uh, you're less likely to have a leak in the mask. All right, self-contained breathing apparatuses. Just like the name says, self-contained. You, each per individual person is carrying, you know, some sort of tank, something that's producing the atmosphere they're breathing, something that's producing the air. It's self-contained, and th th we use these in uh, in boot camp when we're doing the damage control, the firefighting in boot camp. Um, it was a big tank you're wearing on your back, and an SCBA, a self-contained breathing apparatus. So we have two categories of this. We've got a closed circuit and an open circuit, and we're going to say a closed circuit is a rebreathing SCBA, where an open circuit is not. So what, what we mean by rebreathing is that Different models uh, working through different ways allow you to rebreathe some of your air. Some of the air that you've exhaled, you're allowed to rebreathe. And some of them use some sort of, uh, uh, we'll, like we'll see in a minute here, use maybe like a cartridge to kind of filter out and, and produce air through some chemical reactions, produce some oxygen through chemical reactions. But a closed circuit, they're, they're, it allows for some rebreathing of your exhaled air, whereas an open circuit doesn't. An open circuit has a way, some sort of valve to get rid of the air you exhale so every time you inhale it's fresh air from the canister right from the cylinder that you're that's providing your atmosphere so our closed circuit one in particular that the chapter talks about that's a little obsolete now but still it wasn't at the time this was written is the OBA which is the Navy's oxygen breathing apparatus and what the, what this the way this thing is designed is it's actually activated when you exhale there's a this canister right here which, which would go in this pouch this canister is activated when you by exhaled air by air that you exhale from your lungs there's a little bit of a chemical reaction there's actually a uh, a, a candle in there and uh when, when it gets activated, when somebody breathes into it, and it starts actually producing oxygen through chemical reactions. Um, and it allows you to rebreathe some of the air you exhaled as well. Um, so because of that reaction, um, they get really hot. So they cannot be used in a flammable atmosphere due to the heat generated. And you can't even handle them once they've been activated with your bare hands. They get really hot as well. Um, these are not NIOSH approved for commercial use. They're specifically for the Navy. Like I said, it's kind of obsolete. You're not really going to see them anymore. They've all been replaced. They've all been replaced, and you're just not going to see them anymore. So uh, SCBA, when we're talking about closed circuit versus open circuit, closed circuit means it just has some process of allowing you to rebreathe some of the air you exhaled, where open circuit does not. The advantage of a closed circuit is they usually last a little bit longer because you're rebreathing some of your exhaled air, where your open circuit, just the air you bring in with you, is all you got, so they won't last as long. Two other special types of SCBAs are the EEBD, the Emergency Escape Breathing Device, and the uh, Supplemental Emergency Escape Device, a SEED, okay? But these guys, we, with these guys, we can only use these for escape. They are never to be used to enter into a hazardous atmosphere. They're for escape only. They're not for rescue. They're not for firefighting. They're to get out of a space. They just have a very, very short amount of air in them, um, and they're just to get out of a place that's potentially maybe on fire or something going on. They're designed only for egress, right? Your emergency escape breathing device, your, e e your EBBD, oh, EEBD, and your supplemental uh, emergency escape device. Time for a little bit more review. What are the two types of atmosphere supplying respirators? Two types, 
of atmosphere supplying respirators. We've got supplied air and we've got self-contained breathing apparatuses, SCBAs. What is a special type of SCBA developed for the Navy specifically for emergency escape? Special SCBA only for escape, that is your EEBD, your emergency escape breathing device. When are atmosphere supplying respirators required? Atmosphere supplying. So remember, we got air purifying when we're talking broadly and atmosphere supplying. We have to use an atmosphere supplying respirator when the contaminant has no warning properties like carbon monoxide or um, methyl alcohol or the isocyanates or hydrogen cyanide. Um, the contaminant's concentration is too high for an air purifying respirator. It just block up the canister, uh, uh, the cartridge. Uh, the environment is immediately dangerous to life and health, all right? So we have to use air supplying, atmosphere supplying respirators when the contaminant has no warning properties, the concentration is too high, um, and then the environment is an IDLH, immediately dangerous to life and health. What is the maximum length of hose for an airline respirator? What is the maximum length of hose for your airline respirator? 300 feet, 300 feet, and that's according to NIOSH. Moving on to respirator fit testing. Each individual who's required to use a respirator shall be qualitatively or quantitatively fit tested before issue, uh, being issued a respirator and then annually thereafter, unless they're wearing an SCBA. You do not need to be fit tested for an SCBA, a self-contained breathing apparatus. So before you use it and then annually after. All right, fit testing can be done by anyone trained to do so on the ship or by medical treatment facilities or Navy environmental preventative medicine units. Qualitative fit testing, quality. A lot of times this is, and then we've got quantitative fit testing. Our qualitative fit testing can be done by like an irritant smoke, like you see in the picture right there. The guy's got his uh, respirator on. It looks like it's kind of a purple color, so we know it's a P class. But you can put some sort of irritant smoke, you know, uh, up against it, uh, blown into the canister, and then the person, the personnel tries to see if they can smell it, if it causes any kind of irritation. Uh, they can use some isoamyl acetate or some banana oil. Um, they can use some saccharin mist or they can use some bitrix. Where your quantitative fit testing will quantitative uh, is only performed by and shall be requested from shore activities. This isn't something you can really do on a ship and it detects to see if there's any kind of leakage. It actually gives you like a, num a numerical value. So you can see right here, and this is special training. This isn't gonna be something the respiratory uh, protection manager is gonna be doing. This is something that you gotta go to an actual MTF or an NEPMU to have that done, okay? So quality, right? Quantity, quantity gives you the number, uh, it's, it's quantitative, right? Whereas quality, a lot of times you just have the person say, hey, is this causing irritation or smell or anything like that? Um, but your quantitative, it can only be performed by special activities ashore. We can't, you're not gonna have personnel trained in an operational setting to use that thing. Inspections, All right? Respirators shall be inspected routinely before and after each use. Emergency use respirators will be inspected after each use and at least monthly. Okay, emergency respirators need to be inspected at least monthly. Um, and then inspection reports are going to be kept, maintained for the life of the respirator. Okay, so this one's a little bit different. A lot of times when we think about keeping records, we're talking only two years. Well, with the respirators, we keep the inspection report on that respirator for the life of the respirator as long as we have that respirator. All right, entry into an immediately dangerous to life or health, IDLH uh, in atmospheres. So only two type of respirators can be used to do this. And remember, we can't use any kind of uh, air purifying respirators. So we can use a full face piece uh, self-contained breathing apparatus or a full face piece airline. All right, and if we're using an airline, because the, the air is, remember, that's a big old hose, a big old line, and whatever's producing the air is usually, is not in the environment, okay? So we this person could be up to 300 feet from whatever's producing the air. They can have a 300-foot long hose. So if you're using an airline respirator to go into uh, an immediately dangerous to life or health uh, area, you have to carry some auxiliary air with you, a self-contained supply of air that's at least 15 minutes worth of air. So if something happens to 
to the hose, something happens to the respirator or the air supply, you could escape because you got 15 minutes of auxiliary air. And if you know you're going to be somewhere where you can't get out of there for 15 minutes, they've got to carry an SC, an SCBA. All right. So they'd have their, their airline and then they have that SCBA with 30 minutes of, of air on them just in case something happens and they have to get out of there and they have to change into that for their, uh, for their respirator, for their air supply. Okay. So we can only go into an uh, IDLH, right? An, an area immediately dangerous to life and health and a full face piece SCBA or a full face piece airline. But if you're using the airline, you've got to take 15 minutes worth of auxiliary self-contained air on you on your body um, or if you know that's not going to be enough you got to take an SCBA with you all right an OBA can be used if all of the following conditions are met okay so you can use an OBA the Navy oxygen breathing apparatus for entry into an immediately dangerous to life or our health uh, atmosphere if you're underway. All of these things have to be met. You got to be underway. Uh, it's required for emergency or operate, operational readiness reason, and it's approved by the CO. All three of those conditions need to be met. Otherwise, they're just going to wait until the ship's in port, and then wait. And if if you don't have the other, you know, capabilities, they, you're just supposed to wait until the ship's in port and deal with it then. Then you can get the appropriate SCBA or the appropriate uh, airline to go in there. But if all you have is an OBA and you're underway and it's an emergency and it's approved by the CO, then you can uh, you can enter into a place with that's uh, immediately dangerous to life or health. All right. So further requirements for the IDLH uh, atmosphere. You got to have standby personnel. OK, at least one train standby with a suitable respirator shall be present in the nearest uncontaminated uncontaminated area in case something happens. They can go in. But before they go in, they got to get another standby. OK, so before they go in, another standby that meets the same criteria has to be there. But you got to have at least one standby with a suitable respirator present in the nearest uncontaminated area. Communication. There's got to be a way to communicate, right? Standby personnel and the person working or the people working in the IDLH atmosphere, they got to be able to communicate continuously with each other. And then rescue equipment, okay? Uh, persons who enter any IDLH uh, atmosphere shall also be equipped with a safety harness and lines and a hoist will also be present as well. Moving on to some responsibilities. The commanding officer he needs to appoint a respiratory protection manager. Your respiratory protection manager, they got to get trained, right? So once they've been assumed the position, they've got three months to complete the course. And that course is the respiratory, uh, respiratory protection program management course through the Navy Occupational Safety Health and Environment Training Center. Okay, they got three months to get that done. Uh, they got to ensure sufficient supply of NIOSH approved respirators, spare parts, and expendable supplies are maintained. They've got to maintain a current roster of personnel enrolled in the respiratory protection program. They've got to conduct respiratory fit testing. Your respiratory protection manager, your RPM, is the one that does the fit testing. They've got to establish central control points for issuing and maintaining respiratory equipment. They've got to inspect, clean, disinfect, store, and maintain and repair your respirators. And they've got to ensure breathing air meets quality requirements. And they also have to evaluate their program at least annually okay the respiratory protection program needs to be evaluated annually your divos your divo your division officers they got to ensure that personnel have current fit testing or trained prior to donning the respirator they got to make sure they look at the industrial hygiene survey and workplace evaluations so they know what work tasks require respiratory protection so that's a, that's a reference for them if they don't know if they need to use like an air purifying respirator for a certain task they can look at the industrial hygiene survey um, they need to ensure that personnel are provided with and issued the required respiratory equipment your medical department representative, well, they got to confirm the personnel who are issued respirators have no deployment limiting conditions and have a current annual PHA. You don't need a special physical to wear a respirator. You just have to have a current PHA and no deployment limiting conditions. You can't be on any kind of limb do or anything like that going on. Um, they also assist the respiratory protection manager in identifying and evaluating hazards and helping them select the appropriate respirator. All right, a little more review here. Uh, how often is respirator fit testing conducted? How often is respirator fit testing conducted? You're going to do that on initial issue and then annually thereafter. How often are emergency respirators inspected? 
How often are emergency respirators inspected? They're going to be inspected after each use and at least monthly. After each use and at least monthly. How long are inspection reports on emergency respirators maintained? How long do we keep those reports? We keep them for the life of the respirator. For the life of the respirator. If entering in an atmosphere immediately dangerous to life or health with an airline respirator, what additional equipment is required? Right, so entering, if you got the airline respirator specifically here now, right, immediately dangerous to life and health, what else do you got to carry? You need 15 minutes of self-contained auxiliary air supply, 15 minutes of self-contained extra air. How often are emergency respirators inspected? How often are emergency respirators inspected? Um, after each use and at least monthly, Within how many months must a respiratory protection program management course be attended by the newly assigned respiratory protection manager? How, uh, how many months does he have to get that, he or she have to get that training done? They've got three months, three months. How often must a respiratory protection manager evaluate the respiratory protection program? How often does the RPM need to do an evaluation on the program? They got to do it annually, got to do it annually, at least once a year. All right, that concludes this presentation. Like I said, it's from OpNav 5119 Echo, uh, Chapter B6, Respiratory Control. Like always, I hope these help. Keep studying.